Nearly 50 years down the track, the cold case disappearance of Richard John Bingham, the 7th Earl of Lucan, remains notoriously unsolved. However, it's still impacting lives, with some claiming a cover-up and others a range of varied, sometimes bizarre, explanations. Not least with a huge interest in seeing the British case pursued is a son of the family nanny whose life Lucan is alleged to have ended. Born in 1934, Lucan seemed to have developed a gambling addiction during his school years at Eton College and quit a solid bank job to become a professional gambler at the age of 26. He inherited the title of Lord Lucan four years later after the passing of his father. Lucan also had a taste for a lavish lifestyle, driving an Aston Martin and, in his spare time, racing powerboat. He even dabbled in acting and was considered for the role of James Bond in its first film adaptation. By 1972, however, Lord Lucan found himself in a downward spiral of excessive drinking, overspending and huge gambling debts. He was also embroiled in a bitter custody battle with his estranged wife Veronica, Lady Lucan, for their three children. This included his stalking her, recording their phone calls and employing private detectives in attempts to discredit her. As Lucan was seemingly losing his grip on reality, at the end of 1974, the unthinkable took place. On the night of November 7, 1974, an intruder apparently entered Lady Lucan's London home at 46 Lower Belgrave Street. Sandra Rivett, the family's nanny, was there at the time and met a brutal end at his hands. Lady Lucan also came under attack when she realised that the assailant was her estranged husband. She managed to escape, staggering to a nearby pub to seek help. November 7th was a Thursday and therefore Sandra Rivett's usual day off. It was theorised that Lord Lucan expected Sandra to be absent and so, also removing the basement light globe, mistook the nanny for his wife. Veronica had told some of Lucan's previous assaults and even claimed to fear for her life. By the time police arrived on the scene, Lucan had fled and driven 42 miles to a friend's house in East Sussex. The last confirmed sighting of him was by his friend's wife, Susan Maxwell Scott, where he had visited in the early hours of November 8th and also posted two letters to other friends. He described his evening's experiences as a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidence when he had happened to be walking by his ex-wife's house and witnessed the torrid events. Lucan's car was later found near New Haven, about 16 miles further on. It contained several bloodstains and a length of metal pipe wrapped in surgical tape, which was very similar to the crucial weapon left behind at the crime scene. One of the letters sent by Lucan was also spotted with blood. Given the overwhelming circumstantial evidence, an arrest warrant was issued and Interpol notified, triggering an international manhunt. Lucan's aristocratic friends and acquaintances were duly questioned, but his whereabouts were never discovered. He had left behind all his personal effects, including wallet, car and car keys, driver's licence and passport. In June 1975, a full coroner's inquest investigated the fate of Sandra Rivett, the deceased nanny. It returned a verdict of willful homicide and specifically named Lucan as the perpetrator. The shocking pronouncement was the first time since 1760 that a member of the House of Lords had been fingered by a coroner's inquest. It was also the last time a coroner's inquest ever named a suspect without or prior to a trial as the law was changed after that. Speculation gripped the media and public debate. Some believed that Lucan had used his connections to begin a life in a distant country. Others suggested that he had taken his own life in an act of desperation and also so as not to subject his family and himself to the media frenzy that plagued his case. As a coroner's jury had already branded him guilty, a trial jury would almost certainly have followed that verdict. Several police officers and former friends believed the self-harm theory plausible, whether with or without help from others. 
In an interview before her passing in 2017, Lady Lucan agreed that this would have been the brave and noble thing to do. However, many thought that Lucan's aristocratic friends had assisted him in fleeing England and evading the international dragnet cast so wide. Yet another theory suggested that Lucan's connections did help with his escape, then discreetly had him done away with. While this particular train of thought sounds like conspiracy, it does carry some supporting evidence. Lucan had amassed huge gambling debts and also been closely involved with John Aspinall, a well-known zoo owner and the founder of the Clermont Club. This was a casino and private members club which operated in London during the 1960s. It was an expensive and upmarket venue boasting many aristocratic and high-profile political patrons. The club was also a hotspot for illegal cons designed to extract money from the rich. One was called the Big Edge, which involved slightly bending certain cards in a particular way to enable the house to cream off more money on each card game. Aspinall was allegedly able to make this scam viable with the help of Billy Hill, an infamous English gangster. Lucan was virtually a daily presence at the Clermont, and as a constant player who was friends with Aspinall, he was bound to know about the skimming, cheating and Big Edge scam. For this reason, it was possible that in asking Aspinall and his associates for help after the homicide, Lucan may have placed himself into the hands of individuals who wanted him permanently silenced. One version of this theory suggests that Lucan was allegedly fed to Aspinall's zoo tigers. However, it was also very possible that Lucan's high-ranking connections helped him escape and swiftly closed ranks to protect both him and themselves. Before his passing in 2000, Aspinall made reference to such a possibility. Aspinall had always claimed that Lucan had deliberately drowned by scuttling his motorboat and leaping into the English Channel with a stone tied around his body. However, a slip of the tongue in a 1990 interview had him indicating that their friendship had endured beyond that time. Aspinall's ex-secretary also later disclosed that around 1980, she had been instructed to book two trips for Lucan's children to Kenya and Gabon to enable Lucan to see them from a distance. He was not to meet or speak to them. Whatever the truth, there have been numerous reported sightings of so-called Lucky Lord Lucan in Africa, India and New Zealand, although none has ever been verified, and endless theories as to what happened to him. However, one man who is intricately involved in the cold case and has conducted his own investigations is the victim's son, Neil Berryman. He states that he found out only 12 years ago that he was Sandra Rivett's secret son who was adopted out soon after birth. He states that last year he provided the police with evidence that Lucan, who would now be 85, is alive and residing in a Buddhist commune in Australia. He claims that the police have several photographs and videos of the man he believes is Lucan, at whose hands his mother, Sandra Rivett, lost her life. The suspect he has located is English, in the right age group, and speaks with an upper-class accent. Berryman believes that the Metropolitan Police's cold case unit is now investigating his claim, although he is concerned that it is taking so long. He understands that the man he has found is now seriously ill and is concerned that he may not face justice, but also worries that the establishment has closed ranks on the cold case and just wants it to go away. The High Court formally declared Lucan deceased on February 3, 2016, which was when Berryman received detailed information by letter that Lucan was actually alive. He has since spent £30,000 of his own money investigating the claim, while Scotland Yard continues to reassure him that they are pursuing his leads. They now claim to be hampered by international agreements and pandemic restrictions. In the meantime, the case continues to linger in the public's awareness long after the event, and with no other suspects ever having been suggested, the pernicious crime around Sandra Rivett's homicide remains officially unsolved.